Chapter 7, Section 3. Can there be right-wing anarchism? <laughs> uh, Hart, of course, mentions the individualist anarchist calling Tucker's ideas laissez-faire liberalism. However, Tucker called his, called his ideas socialism and presented a left-wing critique of most aspects of liberalism, particularly its Lockean-based private property rights. Tucker based much of his ideas on Proudhon, so if Hart dismisses the latter as a socialist, then this must apply to the former. Given that he notes that there are, quote, two main kinds of anarchist thought, namely communist anarchism, which denies the rights of individual to seek profit, charge rent or interest, and to own property, and a right-wing proprietary anarchism, which vigorously defends these rights. <laughs> then Tucker like Godwin, would have to be placed in the left-wing camp. Tucker, after all, argued that he aimed for the end of profit, the end of interest, and rent, and attacked private property in land and housing beyond occupancy and use. As can be seen, Hart's account of the history of anti-state liberalism is, of course, flawed. Godwin is included only by ignoring his views on property, Views which, in many ways, reflect the later socialist, i.e. anarchist, analysis of Proudhon. He then discusses a few individuals who were alone in their opinions, even within extreme free market right, and all of whom knew of anarchism and explicitly rejected the name for their respective ideologies. In fact, they preferred the term government to describe their systems when, on the face of it, it would be hard to reconcile the usual so-called anarcho-capitalist definition of anarchism as being no government. Hart's discussion of individualist anarchism is equally flawed, failing to discuss their economic views just as well as it links to left-wing anarchism would be obvious. However, the similarities of Molinari's views with what would become later known as so-called anarcho-capitalism are clear. Hart notes that with Molinari's death in 1912, quote, liberal anti-statism virtually disappeared until it was rediscovered by the economist Murray Rothbard in the late 1950s. While this Fringe is somewhat bigger than previously. The fact remains that the ideas expounded by uh, Rothbard are just as alien to the anarchist tradition as Molinari's. It's a shame that Rothbard, like his predecessors, did not call his ideology something other than anarchism. Not only would it have been more accurate, it would have also led to much less confusion and no need to write this entire document. As it stands, the only reason why so-called anarcho-capitalism is considered a form of anarchism by some is because one person, Murray fucking Rothbard, decided to steal the name of a well-established and widespread political and social theory and movement and apply it to an ideology with little, if any, in common with it. As Hart inadvertently shows, it's not a firm base to build a claim. That anyone can consider so-called anarcho-capitalism as anarchist simply flows from a lack of knowledge about anarchism. As numerous anarchists have argued, including this one, for example, quote, Rothbard's conjunction of anarchism with capitalism, according to David Wyke, results in a conception that is entirely outside the mainstream of anarchist theoretical writings or social movements. This conjunction is a self-contradiction. The main con uh, traditions of anarchism are entirely different. These traditions and theoretical writings associated with them express the perspectives and aspirations and also sometimes the rage of oppressed people in human society. Not only those economically oppressed, although major anarchist movements have been mainly movements of workers and peasants, but also those oppressed by power in all of those social dimensions, including, of course, that of political power expressed in the state. In other words, anarchism re represents a moral commitment Rothbard's anarchism I take to be diametrically opposite. It's a shame that some academics consider only the word Rothbard uses as relevant rather than the content and its relation to anarchist theory and history. If they did, they'd soon realize that the expressed opposition of so many anarchists to so-called anarcho-capitalism uh, anarcho is something which cannot be ignored or dismissed. In other words, a right-wing anarchist cannot and does not exist. No matter how often they use that word to describe their ideology, as Bob Black put it, a right-wing anarchist is just a minarchist who'd abolish the state to his own satisfaction by calling it something else. They don't denounce what the state does, they just object to who it's, who's doing it, libertarian as conservative. The reason is simple. Anarchist uh, economics and politics cannot be artificially separated. They're linked. 
Godwin and Proudhon did not stop their analysis at the state. They extended it to the social relationships produced by inequality of wealth, i.e. economic power as well as political power. To see why, we need to only consult Rothbard's work. As noted in the last section, for Rothbard, the key issue with the voluntary taxationists was not who determined the body of absolute law, but rather who enforced it. In his discussion, he argued that a democratic defense agency is at a disadvantage in his free market system, or as he put it, quote, it would in fact be competing at a severe disadvantage, having been established on the principle of democratic voting. Looked at as a market phenomenon, democratic voting, one vote, one person, is simply the method of the consumer cooperative. Empirically, it has been demonstrated time and again that cooperatives cannot compete successfully against stock-owned companies, especially when both are equal before the law. There's no reason to believe that cooperatives for defense would be any more efficient. Hence, we may expect the old cooperative government to wither away through loss of customers on the market, while joint stock, i.e. corporate defense agencies, would become the prevailing market form. So many problems with that statement. But let's just start with, notice how he assumes that both cooperative and uh, corporations would be equal before the law. But who determines that law? Obviously not a democratically elected government, as the idea of one person, one vote, in determining the common law are all subject to its inefficient. Nor does he think, like the individualist anarchist, that the law would be judged by juries along with the facts. As was noted in Chapter 1, Section 4, he rejects that in favor of it be de- being determined by libertarian lawyers and jurists. Thus, the law is unchangeable by ordinary people and enforced by private defense agencies hired to protect liberty and property of the owning class. In the case of capitalist economy, this means defending the power of landlords and capitalists against rebel tenants and workers. This means that Rothbard's common law code will be determined, interpreted, enforced, and amended by corporations based on the will of the majority of shareholders, i.e., the rich. That hardly seems likely to produce equality before the law. As he argues in a footnote, there is a strong a priori reason for believing that corporations will be superior to cooperatives in any given situation. For if each owner receives only one vote regardless of how much money he has invested in a project and earnings are divided in the same way, there's no incentive to invest more than the next man. In fact, every incentive is the other way. This hampering of investment militates strongly and against the cooperative form. So, if the law is determined by defense agencies and courts then, it will be determined by those who have invested most in these companies. It's, it is, as it's unlikely that the rich will invest in defense firms, which don't support their property rights, power, profits, and definition of property rights, it's clear that agencies which favor the wealthy will survive on the market. The idea that market demand will counter this uh, class rule seems unlikely, given Rothbard's own argument. After all, in order to compete successfully, you need more than demand. You need source of investment. If cooperative defense uh, agencies do form, they'll be at a market disadvantage due to the lack of investment. Even though cooperatives are more efficient than capitalist firms, lack of investment caused by the lack of control by capitalist Rothbard's notes, this, uh, as, it, this stops them replacing wage slavery. Thus, capitalist wealth and power inhibits the spread of freedom in production. If we apply his own argument to Rothbard's system, we suggest that the market in defense will also stop the spread of more libertarian associations thanks to capitalist power and wealth. In other words, like any market, Rothbard's defense market will simply reflect the interests of the elite, not the masses. Moreover, you can expect any democratic defense agency like a union to support, say, striking workers or squatting tenants to be crushed. This is because, as Rothbard stresses, all defense firms would be expected to apply the common law as written by libertarian lawyers and jurists. If they did not, they would be quickly labeled outlaw agencies and crushed by the others, legally. Ironically, Tucker would join Bakunin and Kropokin in an anarchist court accused to violate, uh, accused of violating anarchist law by practicing and advocating occupancy and use rather than the approved Rothbardian property rights. 
even if these democratic defense agencies could survive and not be driven out of the market by a combination of lack of investment and violence due to their outlaw status, there is another problem. As was discussed in chapter one, landlords and capitalists have a monopoly of decision-making power over their property. As such, they can simply refuse to recognize any democratic agency as a legitimate defense association and use the same tactics perfected against unions to ensure that it does not uh, gain a foothold in their domain. See chapter six on more details for that one. Clearly then, a right-wing anarchism is impossible as any system based on capitalist property rights will simply be an oligarchy run by and for the wealthy. As Rothbard notes, any defense agency based on democratic principles will not survive in the market for defense simply because it 